Okay, so Matt's at the beach with the family, and Jeff is coming here to calibrate the home theater. So, um, I guess I'm gonna go try and record that in the Miata right now. Little tricky, that limb just fell from that tree, that's terrifying. <laughs> So just to give everyone an uh, idea of what we're doing, right now we're just doing our test tones to uh, make sure all of our speakers are putting out the right tone, the right location, so we can actually start and uh, you know do the work that we need to do. Well, I shouldn't say we, Jeff, <laughs> will be doing. <laughs> but um, that's what we're doing right now. So here this is confirmed that it's in the Atmos mode here. And so that's that's function properly. Okay. And it's the preamp receiver is putting out the proper signal types for the speaker. So that's it thinks it's doing the right thing and the right sound came out of the right channel there. Mm -hmm. And we'll just step through in here and see. And also it's I'm listening to it too. Did you hear how dull that one is? So that was really wrong. So it mm -hmm. seemed that one it was so that they're definitely not correct right now. They need so to be the, calibrated to exactly. sexually send the right so that, noise to the location where you're sitting. Well the, the to um, adjust the frequency response of the channel. So the channel levels I mean the sub was probably a little hot and the, the channel levels uh, were not too bad. But the frequency response of several of the channels was way off. So I'm gonna, when I get to that, then we'll readjust it. But this also gave me a feel for what's wrong with it initially. And so, I heard some acoustic problems too, but I'm not gonna be able to yeah. <laughs> fix that. I'll give him some suggestions about what to do. So like when you do that frequency work, is it like kind of flattening it to make sure that all the speakers kind of sound the same in an aspect or? Yeah, you're, you're shooting for um, the reference response curve for this type of situation, which is something Simpty specifies as the 222M curve. And so I'm shooting for that in okay. here, one of the variants of that. Um, yeah. Now I'm gonna check uh, polarity. I remember, uh, I don't know if it was your recommendation or Matt told me, he said, the Marantz can sometimes switch polarity depending on... Yes, I've yeah. seen problem. I've seen many software bugs with Marantz. Like, I had a... Polk LSCI9s, I want to say it was. Okay. And the Marantz, no matter what, would always detect it as reverse polarity, even though I check it every single time. And I was well, like, you, is that because of the crossover? It might be set up some weird way? Or? It, it's possible. You, you need like an absolute phase test to really know. So I have uh, a disc with me here and a test tool where I'm going to measure absolute phase. Mm -hmm. And so. I'm going to be able to tell what the exact polarity is okay. coming out of the speaker, so I don't have to rely on um, any internal tests within these products. I basically have all of my own tests with me, okay, so that I don't have to rely on and that is like thing that Dan or Yama that like generates like a pop or something, and then it it is it it's hears going to generate it. a click, and then that that creates a pressure p pressure rise, mm -hmm. and so this is going to look for a pressure rise. So if you look here, see it says question mark now, it doesn't know what it is. Yeah, yeah. And if it's right, it'll say plus. If it's wrong, it'll say minus. Huh. And so then we'll flip the polarity until we get a plus. Huh, that's, that's cool. <laughs> kind of thing. Yeah, it is. It's very cool. And so <laughs> it, it works like, well, it generally works. It's not 100%, but it, it... It's better than relying on some kind of software and hardware that's like... Yeah, I found that this, of all the... I've tested, I don't know, five or six different products on the market. I have several others with me, and, and this is the one that's the most reliable of all of them I've found. that Because you can obviously test this in your home by, by throwing it out of phase on purpose. And, yeah. And, and so that's how I verify my equipment is I'll check it at my house, and make sure that what I'm measuring is what it, what it should be. Do 
obviously that's good. We're getting the plus, right? Yep. Yeah, it's good. Because if these, definitely the subs have to be in phase. Mm -hmm. Otherwise they'll fight each other. So it's not uncommon when I walk down to a multiple sub system that one's pulling one's, and one's pushing. One's pulling and one's pushing. The person is really unhappy that they're not getting any base. Yeah. And it's that, and his are perfect. So okay. There's no issues here in this case, but it's actually in a normal situation a pretty high chance of it. So these are the DSP ones. So they have. Yeah, I'm wanting to turn them off. Oh, these are heavier than I remember. Yeah, they they can interfere with my measurement and the other speakers. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm gonna disable these temporarily. Sound can be so loud, especially like right now, the sub's hot, um, so it, might it just can overwhelm. Cause a problem with the other readings. Yeah, see like here, we're getting the negative. Let's see. Take these off. Yeah, see this guy's out of phase. These are all magnetic, so. Or maybe not. Yeah, well, there it's we're getting right. So I can check it. Once I know these are in phase, mm -hmm. then I have other ways to tell too. But it's um, here. Let's take this. It's a good thing to leave them off while you're doing this, anyways. Yeah, so that's good. Yeah, good. Okay, we're good. And we can cross check that with looking at how they cross over. So, yeah. If things are going weird on the crossover, like they might like invert the tweeter or something. Yeah, you can see it. And so, yeah, the, the tweeter could, that's not going to affect it. But what I'm more interested in is does it blend well with these? So, mm -hmm. you want the sub and the low frequency drivers in the speakers to, to blend seamlessly. Yeah. Um, so, that's. One of the main things that, that I'm interested in when I'm doing this. Newer receiver, and I was yeah. like, I don't know which way to go. I'm like, pretty much the whoever owns Marantz and Denon yeah. now own almost. Yeah, the only brands I 90% of the I recommend are Anthem and Yamaha. Mm -hmm. So I mean, it, it um, if I'm doing the setup, I can do more with the Yamaha. Mm -hmm. um, but if you're just going to buy something, then I would buy Anthem or or Yamaha. And then, um, um, what was the other one? NAB? They have like... NAD, you mean? Or? NA, NAD, not NAB. NAD. And they have, have what is that called? I've not seen too many NAD units, but my experience with those has not been good. N they use like some weird caliber, because this has Yapau, and this has Dirac with the NADs. Yeah, I, my experience with the AutoCal is that ARC is the best AutoCal on the market, and then the Yamahas are the best performing units on the market, mm -hmm. but their auto cal's not very good. Yeah, I know everyone says something about how the sub gets EQ'd with Yamaha, where, where you have to go in manually. I just don't think, you know, most of them, their mics are not good enough. Yeah, I mean, you look at it, it's like, a, what, like a $15, $20 yeah. mic it looks like. Yeah, so. but like an Anthem, I mean, I have one of their mics with me here. I mean, this is, because Anthem requires a separate software. This is the mic that comes with the Anthem unit. Yeah, see with Paradigm. Looks way better than the other ones. Yeah, it's a better <laughs> mic. It's still not this class of microphone. Mm -hmm. You know, so I mean, that's what I'm using. But at least it's not extremely poor. Yeah, because... You know, so the, the problem you run into is that if you're, if you're equalizing below about 1 kilohertz or 250 hertz, the cheaper mics can tend to work there. Mm -hmm. When the higher the frequency you go, the better the mic needs to be. That that having a microphone that works well at 20 kilohertz or 10 kilohertz is tends to be expensive. Yeah. <laughs> and so that yeah, where this is like a $1,200 microphone, Ooh. for example, <laughs> and then this is uh, um, so this one is probably a I don't know maybe a $50 microphone, and then this was a $700 microphone. So that's sort of the Gives you an idea. So, yeah. <laughs> and then this one, this one is a good mic too. So, I mean, this is a uh, Earthworks M30 is what this is, which is uh, used in a lot of professional applications. 
I like this one better. It has a lower noise floor, mm -hmm. um, so it works better. It's just more stable. I mean, it's a it's a better mic, but but it, it's you know a lot more money. Than, yeah, and, and I do a lot of this, and so I can afford to. So it's like everyone arguing about Odyssey and Yapow. It's like it's not even really relevant because they're so. Yeah, the I don't I don't particularly care for Odyssey. Mm -hmm. um, the the in general the I, I believe that they YPAL approach to me is is in theory better than Odyssey, but in practice, probably not. But but um, I don't like how many parameters Odyssey uses per channel. Mm -hmm. So you know, in essence, we get really high quality audio data in many cases, you know, for movies and, and music, and Odyssey applies a lot of parameters, so does Dirac. And it's sort of the opposite of what a, audio file would be doing mm -hmm. and I'm more in that camp yeah <laughs> then I am in like well let's mathematically caress this data as much as possible yeah like just process it and check yeah, it again and again I, I'm and this... more in the mode of let's do the minimum we have to do mm -hmm. to get the to get the best sound um, and if that means you just adjust channel levels then I'm good with that if, if it means oh we've got a Fine tune treble or bass, mid range a little here or there, or maybe do a lot of it, but but do the minimum, not. Yeah, instead of adding like twelve filters onto one channel, like I think they it's probably more do. Order of thousands. Thousands, ooh wow. <laughs> yeah, they, they do fine on impulse response modeling, and um, that is going to be thousands of parameters. Per wow. Channel. Uh, um, so the way that they do it. I'm so you're messing with the signal so much at that point. Yeah, and so here you have this very high precision data coming in and you've over adjusted it in my opinion yeah and, and the better your equipment is the worse that strategy is in, in my opinion if you have you know really low end equipment like a home theater in the box mm -hmm. maybe that works for that yeah but, but um i do some of those applications as well and i would say that is the only time i use odyssey but it isn't every time mm -hmm. But there are times that the manual adjustments just aren't strong enough with, you know, in, in these units. Yeah. And so Odyssey's a lot more heavy-handed, and so it can be more aggressive than what is available on the manual huh. side, which sort of shows what it's about. You know, it's it's pretty heavy-handed. So th in those cases, sometimes, I mean, I'll approach it manually initially, and then if I think it's not. If it's not working, then I will go and run it. But maybe that's one out of 300, 400 times. I mean, yeah, very rare. <laughs> you know. Yeah, all I did, I think he did, was uh, set up the channels and make sure. And he did that properly. <laughs> he, <laughs> he wired it perfectly. Yeah, no. He's the this many channels. Uh, I'd say less than half I walk into are wired right. Oh wow. The subwoofer is elevate, elevated on the, over the average level about 8 dB or so, so pretty hot, mm -hmm. which is what I was hearing. Yeah. Um, so uh, that just sort of shows where we're at, and that's not as smooth as what it should look. It should be flatter than that. Mm -hmm. So I start out with everything at large. Okay. And then we see where we need to go from there. Imagine that allows you to get the full reading of what the speaker's doing, and then you exactly. can go in and tweak it how you need it. Yeah, exactly. So then you have the ability to go in and decide. They won't be large in the end, but you, you can't tell what the crossover should be or anything mm -hmm. until you look at the full frequency response of it. And then you may also hear distortions and things like that that happen. Okay. And then this should be set to monaural by two situation.
accuracy. How accurate do you think when they run that auto cal? I mean, you could obviously measure it, but how do you yeah. how accurate do you think that actually is when it uses that microphone to measure? It, it varies. Sometimes it can be very accurate, and sometimes it's way off. Huh. Um, if you have a phase error, that almost always will show up as a big distance difference, mm -hmm. and that usually indicates a phase problem. So if you run the auto calibration and it gives you a distance, let's say twice what it really is, then almost every case, that's a phase error. Huh. Um, frequently, they're pretty close, uh, if you position the mic correctly. Mm -hmm. A lot of people will stick it in the middle of the room or something, and then it's not close enough. Yeah. Um, it's, a, it's a measurement that doesn't have to be incredibly close. But it's just good. Within to, a foot is is usually close enough. But um, I would say in general, it's probably their best thing they do mm -hmm. because it's pretty obvious when they bust it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you know they, they they'll, they'll they'll get pretty quick feedback that from customers probably if if they were really off on distance. Yeah, thirty foot instead of a uh, fifteen yeah. foot. <laughs> there's there's quite a few times that. If the person has run it, I'll go in there and I'll check it, and I don't change anything. Mm -hmm. And then there's times where they've positioned the mic incorrectly, and I change everything. And then there's times where there's phase problems that are obvious to me when I see the numbers. Mm -hmm. And then it's like, oh, okay, yeah. we need to make sure we get phase right because that distance is way off. And then there's sometimes where the physical distance actually doesn't um, match the um, timing distance that you need. So mm -hmm. This is a timing thing, and so some subwoofers has pro have processing delays on them. Mm -hmm. and so it is possible that when you check this, that you don't line up in phase, and then you have to shift it around to to match the the actual delay that's present. Okay, it doesn't tend to happen at all with um, the other speakers, but but on the sub it can. Hmm. So if you insert like a DSP in the middle or something like that. Like that the, processing time might just mess it up. Yeah. To where your might, audio timing. It might be 10 feet, you know, on that, which would be 10, about 10 milliseconds. And so, you know, you, you, you have to be paying attention. That's why you do the absolute phase measurement first. Mm -hmm. Then you know, oh, my absolute phase is right. I'm still not in phase when I check. So I have to compensate because it is an absolute. It is not an absolute phase. Process. It's just a processing. Yes. Okay. So, huh? I see, those do have DSP in them, but I don't think it's active in any yeah, sense. But not, I don't know. Yeah, we'll, we'll find out how I mean, it works. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we get there. I can see it, and then if it's not if it's not lining up, then I will manually correct it. Yeah. To be in line, but that is maybe. And like a hand ten percent of the systems <laughs> I see, maybe less. I mean, it, it is. It's it's not a real common thing, but it is something that you have to pay attention to. Otherwise, you you may have big problems with at the crossover mm -hmm. with things not um, lining up very well. Basically, you're getting um, loss of signal. And, that looks that looks fancy <laughs> it is so this is like a swiss army knife for audio kind of thing and so it like a generator almost it does actually it is a generator it also will measure room acoustics and other things so it, it can do i do professional installations as well so you can measure speech intelligibility and pa systems and wow <laughs> all sorts of speaker impedance this is about four thousand dollar device so if you have all the, which I do, all the licenses for it. So if you're thinking about doing this, you know, get ready to spend some money. <laughs> yeah, just this here is like six grand. And then that doesn't count any software. And then my light meter, which we're not going to use, is $24,000. Yeah, you either be, better be very rich or hoping to pick this up as a career. <laughs> so It's not the best career choice, probably, for most people. There's only a handful of people that do this. Yeah, because like, imagine you got to go around so many different places, fly out somewhere, go there. Yeah, or drive. I drive. You know. So it's like you gotta you gotta be ready for some travel if you want to do this. Yeah, I travel widely. So. And I always use external test tones for the most part because the tones in most of the receivers are incorrect. <laughs> 
Mm -hmm. So you have to use tones that you know. Or, okay. Okay. Those tones are probably specifically meant for that exact calibration they're trying to do. Purpose, exactly. So yeah. Like this is these tones here are actually designed for level testing, and they're specially conditioned, properly conditioned for that. Um, where unfortunately the level tones that are in these products are not. And mm -hmm. So if you if you use those. You're not going to get as good a result, you know, and you may be way off. Mm -hmm. Also, I've seen times where you change this, and then and the internal tones will change, and yet the the actual tone coming out of the speaker for a real signal won't. Hmm. And so it's a placebo. Yeah. So I've seen that happen several times. Um, so then you have to. Um, base all the other channels off that one that's a placebo and hopefully it is just one. So is there like a general reference you're looking for when doing this? Yeah, I'm shooting for about 75 dB on there. Mm -hmm. um, depends on the seating locations and stuff. So the fronts and... In, in, but anytime a seat gets close to a speaker, you might want to back off so that person doesn't get blasted much sound yeah. yeah so you there are some judgment calls with it um but in general with the tone i'm using at minus 10 on the low volume it would be 75 if it was perfect you know mm -hmm. everything was laid out perfect in the end i said oh by ear so this was just the first pass mm -hmm. just like you would feel a piece of wood yeah right? It's like uh, not there yet, not yeah. sanded well enough. Yeah, you know, exactly. make well, another it's, pass it's with a good analogy of it. The, yeah, you, you because the mic doesn't hear exactly like we hear. It's not, it's truly omnidirectional, and we're not. Mm -hmm. So you have to listen to it once you get. So like this gives close. you your baseline, and then you can tweak. Yeah, I'm within a dB or two usually with that. Mm -hmm. But the last one to two dB, I'm doing by ear. Okay. To make sure that things are are balanced reasonably, and usually it'll be most affected by the things behind you who we don't hear very well, and and above mm -hmm. these, they'll generally be dead on. Um, but uh. I think this one's out of phase. Like I said, that meter's not perfect that I was using, especially when you mm -hmm. have drivers like this and they're ported. Yeah, they so these are by amped. Yeah, so we'll reverse this. It doesn't mean he did it wrong. It could be anything from internally to... Probably the manufacturer of the speaker, okay. but I'm not certain. Right. But this is, like I said, good half the time, at least, you end up doing this. Mm -hmm. Just going back, switching, checking, switching. Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. Seeing you what's going on. Exactly. So you... If you rely on one test or one data point, you know, it's like... You can get fooled. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that can be wrong. <laughs> So you've got to very meticulously go through all these things. Because this tone should sound centered and it was diffuse, so it's not right. I'll be seeing how it phases, um, being particularly astute to to that speaker. Is it really mm -hmm. phased incorrectly? Or it could be, we may have to flip it a little differently to uh, driver-based or something. Maybe just one half of it's out of phase or something. And so, But I can tell from the frequency response. Now, on Yamaha, they do have good test tones for wideband pink noise. So we don't have to use the disc for that. Mm -hmm. One of the few receivers on the market that has any tones that are...
about the same level. Mm -hmm. figure if I touch them it's pretty well. Normally. Along with, I have the same value for that. But you want to check that. Yeah. So is that actively changing on like your RTA software? Oh yeah, I'm watching the frequency response. Here, so I can see what the story is. And I can see how they're working, you know, together with the back ones here. Mm-hmm. If I want Feel like it like what doled it out a little it bit at that too scene. Thin. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I can tell. Right. So. Yeah, just like. Yeah. Okay, so we have completed setting up the surround system in this room, and we started by testing the speakers to make sure they were all functioning properly, 
testing phase in every speaker to make sure it was set up properly and then went in and measured the distances for each speaker entered that into the Yamaha preamp then I used my external test tones and set the channel levels then I went in and, and equalized the individual channels that needed it so like here's the front left channel I measured the frequency response and corrected for frequency anomalies with the various channels in the system to make the uh, frequency response accurate and uniform around the room. Then I blended the subs together. So in this room there's two subs up front, two subs in the back, and I adjusted the levels and um, crossovers phase, low pass filters on the subs to blend them in. Then once I had the subs blended as close as I could get them, I went, I went ahead and equalized the subs as well with the with the Yamaha system. Then once I finished with all of the adjustments with the instrumentation, we listened to test tones throughout the room, rebalanced the levels by listening to the tones, and then listened to music and movies, and I ended up um, adjusting the, some filtering in the subwoofers a little differently and adjusting um, the equalization of the sub slightly differently and adjusted the sub levels a little differently based on what what was heard also readjusted the back channel levels based on what was heard after that we were we were finished mm -hmm.